so without further ado, I'm very pleased now to give the floor to uh, Professor Olivier de, de Schutter, who is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Poverty. So uh, the floor is yours, Olivier. Welcome. Many thanks, uh, Excellencies, uh, my very dear friend, Morten Kierum. It's a great pleasure to be with you on this panel, uh, which is co-convened by the, the Raoul Wallenberg Institute, uh, the um, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and uh, the organizers of the World Human Rights Cities Forum. Um, let me be very clear. I believe cities and local governments have a crucial role to play in implementing economic and social rights, the rights to housing, to food, to health, or to education. In most countries, indeed, it is at municipal level, with municipal budgets, that social housing projects can develop, that land zoning ordinances are adopted, allowing to improve linkages between cities and their rural hinterland, that hospitals and healthcare centers are established, and indeed, that schools are set up and teachers are paid. Moreover, it is often at the local level that social protection is delivered to the local population. And finally, certain municipalities have been providing a, a space for experimenting with innovative tools to protect economic and social rights. For example, in France, since 2016, a number of municipalities have developed the idea of um, territories without long-term unemployment, providing long-term unemployed people with access to jobs created by undertakings especially established to provide employment opportunities, um, providing services to the population in the care economy or to green uh, the economy or, um, or, or launch um, uh, environmentally sound projects. The agility of cities, their ability to respond swiftly and effectively to potential human rights crises was particularly visible during the COVID-19 pandemic. For instance, some cities have sought to better protect undocumented migrant residents who have suffered particularly during the lockdown period and the aftermath of the health crisis in many contexts. In Tunisia, for example, the city of Sfax launched a campaign to identify the needs of migrant residents and find ways to distribute solidarity food baskets or food vouchers to sustain their basic needs during the lockdown, and up to 1,200 benefited from these donations coordinated by the municipality together with the International Organization for Migration. Many municipalities during the crisis provided food to the population or provided relief to allow residents to, play their, to pay their rents during the crisis. The government of Montevideo in Uruguay distributed 10,000 solidarity baskets for vulnerable households, including food and medical utilities. In Birmingham, uh, 7,000 food parcels were provided to vulnerable residents. In Cascais, in Portugal, um, a solidarity system was developed, allowing to distribute food parcels to residents. Particularly atten particular attention went also to older residents during the crisis. Mexico City ensured these populations access to food and medicines by delivering it directly to their homes. In a similar vein, in Italy, Bologna launched the programs of Piano Mais and L'Unione Fa la Spesa, Union to, the, to Do the Groceries, to monitor the situation of senior residents via phone call and establishing home delivery of food supplies and pharmaceutical products, uh, going to uh, senior residents, to people with disabilities, to people with chronic diseases. These services were activated thanks to a protocol between the municipality of Bologna and local civil society organizations. In Argentina, Buenos Aires fostered the creation of a network, Mayores Cuidados, taking care of senior citizens, where local residents helped monitor the situation of older persons and offered them with various kinds of support during the lockdown. In order to protect the right to housing and prevent the risk of people falling into poverty as a result of a loss of income, measures were taken, for example, by the Municipal Council of Washington, D.C. in the U.S., who passed a relief bill allowing to defer mortgage and rent payments 
prohibiting the implementation of rent increases during the emergency and allowing tenants who risked being vacated from their houses to remain in their units until the emergency was over. And we have examples in Montevideo, in Bogota, in Paris, in London, to a similar effect. Now, municipal policies in these areas, I believe, would be further strengthened if grounded in the normative framework of human rights, and if benefits to be provided were defined as legal entitlements that beneficiaries can claim before independent bodies. This would mean four things. First, it would mean a clear definition of both beneficiaries and the entitlements in question. Secondly, it would mean accessible information to beneficiaries about their rights, including by reaching out to the most marginalized populations, people in informal settlements, homeless people, including street children, people without internet access, for example. Thirdly, it would mean effective access to locally established independent bodies where claims to benefits are rejected. Fourth and finally, it would mean protection from corruption, bribery, the protection of whistleblowers, for example, and from discrimination, including discrimination on grounds of socioeconomic disadvantage. What difference would this make? Well, first of all, it would transform the relationship between service providers and users and thus improve accountability. A rights-based approach would reduce the risks of discrimination, of corruption, in the delivery of goods and services essential to lead a decent life. It would reduce the rates of non-take-up of benefits, which often stem from the fear or the shame of users who do not want to be stigmatized as depending on public charity. Indeed, estimates of non-take-up of minimum income benefits in European countries for 2016 were approximately between 50 and 80 percent. And in OECD countries, non-take-up of benefits was 40 to 80 percent in the case of social assistance and housing programs, and 60 to 80 percent for unemployment compensation. Secondly, a rights-based approach would ensure that the services provided are adequate, in other terms, of acceptable quality. The risk otherwise is, as once noted by Richard Titmus, that services for the poor are poor services. Where delivery is top-down, without accountability, municipalities and local service providers may be tempted to tick the boxes, seeking to reach certain quantitative targets, number of beds in shelters for women victims of domestic violence, number of low-income families receiving food aid, percentage of children finishing high school, but this can be at the expense of the quality or adequacy of the service provided, in part because it is very difficult to monitor, to measure objectively such quality. Creating accountability schemes could reduce that risk. For example, by allowing women to complain about the poor equipment in the shelters, to allow families to denounce the quality of the food rations they receive, or by allowing parents to complain about the teacher's repeated absenteeism. Ensuring adequacy in the provision of services would be strongly encouraged by establishing various forms of participation of the public or the end users in the design, implementation, and evaluation of services, and local collectivities are much better equipped to ensure such direct participation than would be possible at higher levels of governance. I was very impressed, for example, in Canada by the Toronto First Duty Project, launched in five localities in support of early childhood education. One component of this project was to improve the involvement of parents in their child's education by giving parents an opportunity to participate in several extracurricular activities, and this resulted in parents interacting with school officials and in minority groups being much more present in their child's education. Third and finally, a rights-based approach to delivery of public services in areas such as health, education, or housing also ensures that affirmative action will be taken to ensure low-income households will be prioritized in the form of targeted universalism that should contribute to reducing inequalities. In Brazil, for example, the city of Rio, where the vast majority of basic education schools are managed by the city municipality, 
proposed under the leadership of Secretary of Education Claudia Costin in 2014-2016 to reform schools located in disadvantaged uh, areas by providing um, those schools uh, better equipment and allowing better access to quality education for children in these neighborhoods. Now, for all these reasons, I'm convinced that cities should lead the objective of achieving the full realization of economic and social rights, and they have a major contribution to make to the fight against poverty and social exclusion. I strongly believe a human rights-based approach can help based on the guarantees of legal entitlements, of accountability, and of participation. I would like to thank you very warmly for being part of this movement. Thank you.